Thank you. So yes, to begin with, um, 3D movies are exactly at the very start like 2D movies. It's an ID. But then every ID is, uh, has to be prepared for 3D. And here we have Josephine de Rob and Antoine Le Boss to, to speak about writing and developing an ID for 3D. So Josephine is a director of stereoscopy. She worked on many movies for art house film with Bim Benders, French blockbusters, and even animation movies such as uh, Minuscule. And uh, Antoine Le Boss is a director and scriptwriter. He's author and co-author on many scripts for cinemas, TV series, and even on stage movies, uh, on stage projects, sorry. And um, you're both involved in the Cross Channel Film Lab, uh, where Antoine is a project manager and uh, Josephine a consultant. Could you just present us briefly what is the Cross Channel? Uh, yes, so, um, hello. Um, the Cross Channel Film Lab is a Franco-British initiative um, which uh, is dedicated to putting together partners coming from the cinema world and from research uh, in order to um, develop feature projects uh, and side-by-side -side work on the writing side and work on the research uh, on, on the images and sounds and uh, try to create the, the possibility that we believe is very strong of a future for independent cinema in uh, both, uh, I mean in 3D for our case, it's, it's, there's another, another part for visual effects, but here we're talking about the 3D side. So um, yes, to, to give you an idea, these are the partners, so it's western part of France where there's a good uh, ground of uh, research centers dealing with uh, impact on the brain, dealing with uh, also research on th uh, 3D sounds, uh, also on pre-visual, pre previous tools. And on the other side of the channel, we have Bournemouth University, uh, National Center for Computer Animation, and uh, Creative England, uh, yeah, 11 partners. Uh, uh, so uh, here are all the partners. I won't bother you with that. And so the basic idea of Crash Channel Film Lab, which started uh, in 2012, is to work on um, uh, helping projects of uh, independent cinema in Europe uh, to use uh, Stereo 3D. And uh, yes, and, and we believe there's a, a fantastic new opportunity for filmmakers in that. Okay, thank you. So Josephine, for people who don't know who is the director of Stereoscopy, could you explain to us <laughs> what's your job? Um, hi, so my name is uh, Josephine Dirobi. Um, I am stereographer. I used to be a stereographer and also a director of Stereoscopy. S a stereographer is uh, the person who takes care about all the 3D adjustment um, on set and after in post-production until the, the end of the grading so the, the final screening of your movie. And the direction of the stereoscopy is really to think about it uh, since the beginning and taking care of the 3D, not only the technical 3D adjustment, it's huge and really important, but what is the meaning of shooting in 3D? What is the meaning of doing a movie in 3D? It's a um, really powerful and wonderful um, medium creative medium, the 3D, it could be. Uh, of course, the financial uh, target is important because we are working with an industry. But um, we can also think about what, what can I get with 3D. Uh, it's obvious that it is another language and we can enhance all the quality of this um, creative medium if we leave the possibility to creative people, director, um, DOP, all the department crew to understand what they can get uh, with the 3D. Uh, that's the reason why I jump literally for uh, the Cross Channel Film Lab um, to um, help people at the really first stage of uh, yeah. uh, writing process. Yeah, so we can say that uh, as director of stereoscopy, you have a really artistic input since the very beginning of the movie, like a DOP or. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. If you are if you are um, only asking a stereographer to do 3D adjustment for the shooting period, yes, you can have 
good 3D adjustment, but you will miss what the 3D can give you. More emotion, more sensation. In front of a uh, 3D picture, you have, as an audience, a physical link. Really, really powerful. Tension, emotion, sensation. Um, what you have in front of a um, 3D picture is a, a real physical relation for the audience. So it, you need to um, just understand uh, what you can get, how it works, and get uh, inside your uh, thinking, creative thinking, uh, since the beginning, so the writing and the pre-production. Okay, uh, I can have more attention, I can have uh, more emotion mm -hmm. with the 3D, and so change, um, think about your mise-en-scene and think about uh, uh, this um, 3D as another language who could help you a lot at the end for, uh, to okay. have another movie. So uh, from your experiences and your workshops in the Cross Channel Film Lab, could you tell us what are the main challenges when writing a 3D movie compared to a 2D movie? Have you already some differences? So, um, as as a starting point, we can uh, we we can give you uh, the result of an experience that we did four years ago. Uh, we've been financed to do tests with the same uh, story, the same core of a story. We were uh, we were exploring how we would write that same core for a three D uh, shoot and for three D movie uh, for three D version uh, for cinema. And then how we would write and direct and edit uh, for uh, the same to, to bring up the, to bring the same idea on screen, but with a 2D uh, uh, environment. And what was really interesting is that we found ourselves in the, in, in in front of the fact that um, we needed for the same core, we needed in 3D five times less shots, and with five times less shots. Uh, we ended up having a result which was double in length after the editing. Uh, which means to us that when people tend to say that uh, if you shoot a 3D movie, uh, you have to uh, you you have to have uh, you have to add a, a percentage in terms of budget. You have to it has it, it's going to be like 20%, uh, for instance, or 30% more expensive if, if it's going to be 3D compared to a 2D version of the same film. But we with these the result we had after our experiences, we discovered that it's not possible to compare because it's a completely different experience that we are creating both for those who create, who write, direct, and edit. It's a completely different experience physiologically. If, it's, if it has to be shown in 3D and not mixed 2D, 3D, then it's a completely different experience. And it, it is possible uh, to use that tool for uh, uh, auteurs, I mean, to create a new kind of uh, poetry for cinema and a new kind of uh, a very deeply new kind of experience for the viewer. And now we all believe that we have to get especially uh, young audiences uh, uh, in Europe. We want to get them, in a way, I mean, back to theaters. And that's one of the ways to attract new people to uh, theaters is to, take to, to, to create new experiences for the viewer that can be attractive enough and, and, and amazing enough. And that for us is why we consider that uh, uh, we have to push auteurs, I mean, art house filmmakers or independent filmmakers, um, to dive into 3D into in order to uh, uh, to make it their language. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you 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 think that in Europe you've got a strong author politic, like director who are writing their own scripts, then they're directing, and you're saying that 3D could be really a good medium for them. It's really the way to work 3D to think, to write your own. Uh, uh, making making a three D movie is uh, the cr it, it is the, it can be the creation of a brand new experience and uh, a brand new poetical experience for the viewers and for the maker and uh, of course if we want to uh, do that for uh, a small or medium budget it means we cannot go into the left part of this drawing which is m what most uh, blockbusters are doing in three D you know uh, work with with action with uh, uh, fast editing and uh, a, a conquest of space, you know? Here, it means that uh, 
uh, we have to work with art house cinema in a world which is more dealing with shape and intimacy. And that is very interesting because uh, when you work with, with the far right side of the drawing, it means you can reduce, of course, the cost of the movie <laughs> very much. And you can enter a new kind of exploration which has not really been done apart from uh, Pina and apart from maybe uh, um, uh, Gravity has been the film which yeah. is in between, you know. Gravity starts with uh, uh, the, the left part of the drawing and ends up exploring the right part. And we believe it is completely possible and amazing to explore the right part of the drawing for, uh, uh, for art house cinema. D don't mi misunderstand uh, the way we talk about blockbuster. Uh, Gravity is a wonderful and beautiful uh, example of a director, someone who takes care about what he can get with 3D and totally uh, adapt a mise-en-scene, sound and picture um, with the 3D and propose a fully extraordinary uh, experience, even if it was uh, a big movie. So uh, the thing is, um, if at the really first step, uh, people can have this possibility to have clue with 3D, understand what they can get uh, with the mise-en-scene, with uh, maybe another way of writing, another way of shooting, of cutting, and get something stronger with the 3D, uh, we, I think uh, uh, this is the reason why we are uh, developing this kind of uh, organism. It's to um, leave the, the author and the creative part uh, to understand the 3D and get inside another uh, language and propose artistically something strong. And uh, on the technical aspect of really writing script, how do you deal with the immersive aspect of 3D and the new grammar of cinema, 3D is uh, inputting in movies? So what is really interesting for a screenwriter is that uh, drama structure uh, is created in order to create immersion for the viewer. I mean, we are, we are in a way building a script, building a story so that we can take the viewer's head and throw it into the screen. But what if the screen itself is throwing itself to the face of the viewer? It means that maybe too much drama structure or uh, you know, uh, too much rhythm in the script can, in a way, destroy the meeting of the viewer and the screen. And what we find really interesting is that uh, 3D can be seen as a medium totally dedicated uh, uh, to, to n slower experiences uh, in cinema. Uh, and that's kind of good for our kids, no? Uh, Not I mean less intense. Not less intense. No, Not less intense, uh, as intense, but with a, s with a slower approach, because we need more brain time to explore but what is happening. It's absolutely the, the example of the beginning of uh, gravity. It's a 10 minutes long shot at the beginning. We are totally immersed with one main character. We are with her, and suddenly uh, he can take our hand as an audience and, and, uh <laughs> and experience a movie uh, during one, uh, one hour and a half. And I think it's really in important to understand that if you have this idea to put a layer of just on the top of your 2D way of doing a movie, you will probably lose what the 3D can give you as, as an author, as an uh, emotion, tension, all the sensation you can get. If you are at the beginning, you have this opportunity to understand, to see, to analyze, uh, to open your perspective and say, okay, I can, ah, okay, is that with the 3D? I can have that, yeah, really interesting, and I will write for that, I will uh, change my mise en scène, and at the end, you will have uh, the opportunity to use a wonderful medium uh, to, to your story. One of the key elements that we discovered working with researchers on the brain, because we have groups of people in our consortium that are working uh, more on the perception side, and it, it seems that the part of the brain which is stimulated by 3D images has nothing to do with the part of the brain which is stimulated by 2D images. And um, uh, the, the type of experience uh, for us as viewers I is of a different nature. And then we have to study that nature in order to understand how we have to, I mean, for instance, we know for, for sure now that uh, the, the, 2D p the part which is stimulated by, the, by 2D images is a, the cognitive part of the brain. And the part which is stimulated by 3D images is far more the uh, reptilian part of the brain 
it, it's the part of the brain which uh, is connected to the most fundamental instincts in, in, in us, meaning that sometimes the, the, the rational part of the brain cannot control uh, what, what we are feeling in front of a, a good 3D uh, moment. And so that means that for a screenwriter, uh, uh, the, 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 the writing experience has to be completely different. And this is why we discovered that if we want to make any progress, if we want to create a new language, um, if we want to, uh, because now we have the tools, you know, uh, 20 years ago it wasn't possible. Now we have the tools. With the new tools, uh, digital tools, most of them, uh, we have the, the fantastic of opportunity of establishing a new language and remembering, remembering of what was the, the initial search for, I mean, the, the beginning in the beginning of photography, uh, 3D photography, uh, uh, more than a century ago, was the thing. Uh, uh, and the only reason why 2D won the war against 3D is because it was easier to reproduce for newspapers. And, uh, but, so, of course, uh, yeah, so, uh, and then it is not because the, 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 two, the flat image won the war uh, uh, at that time, that we have to forget that what was creating amazement, what was creating the deep sensation of a, of a, of a, of a new feeling about the world, about, about what we could perceive of the world, what, what, what was giving us the feeling of a new inquiry for the viewer, uh, uh, through 3D image uh, about what the world is and wh how the world talks to us, uh, it then it, it means that we have to go back to that initial uh, amazement for the beginning of 3D photography in order to go back to a new phenomenology. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for let us discover this new territory of creativity. Um, I'm sorry, we, are, we have to move to the next speaker. Hello, everyone. So, uh, Galien, you're following the evolution of 3D since 15 years, and Coprod is involved in uh, many 3D projects, such as movies, documentaries, um, advertising, and even the uh, art gallery project. Uh, a couple of years ago, Futurican Animation Studio came to see you um, with the project of Minuscule, the Valley of the Lost Ants, um, to help them with the 3D. Could you tell us how, what were their expectations with 3D and maybe their fear and how did you help them? Yeah, it was, um, it's a in very interesting case study, especially after what's been discussed and I could, don't, could not agree more with everything that's been said just, just now. Um, Minuscule was, was very interesting because basically the producer came to us um, saying, hey, we've got this TV show, this is extremely popular TV show um, for those who, who know it, um, we sold very well. And we want to make a feature film out of it. And we want to make it in 3D because it's for kids and we believe that it's going to be a big, big success if we make it in 3D. But we have absolutely no idea where to start, apart from the fact that we know we, we, you need two images, left and right. Um, so we started from, from the uh, storyboard and basically um, the first step was to have a look at it and see how much of a 2D cut it was and what would work fantastically well in, th in 2D but could be very disappointing in 3D. And likewise, what w would, uh, would be quite, you know, not that natural to think of in 3D but, um, um, but would work w really well. So, so that was the first step. And then very, very quickly it was trying to help them through the entire workflow, saying now that we're talking about the storyboard, let's let's check together what step you need all through uh, the complete process of the film and where 3D will be involved from like every little detail and, and we go into that um, just after that um, in order to make sure that the 3D process is you know, um, as painless as possible. Okay, so did you work just as consultant or also as technical? Do you have like a providing a technical issue? Uh, well, basically solutions? what we did was um, a little bit of both was trying first to assess what kind of issues um, the film will, will, will face in 3D, especially because it's an extremely, extremely complex project where um, every single shot is composited. It's real li live action footage with animated insects. So every single shot is um, anim like yeah. it's compositing. <laughs> it's, it was a huge, huge challenge as far as 3D is concerned. Um, let alone in 2D. 
And so, so it, it was a little boss in terms of consultant. Like we, we went through the entire process, checking what, what could be an issue, what could be fine, and then assess what technical solution should be used for every little part, and then what kind of people or technical solution we would recommend and work with and have on board for this project, including stereographer, rig solutions, technical solution, passport solutions, so pretty much everything all through the DCP uh, delivery. Okay, so we can tell that you work with the production as a technical partner like a SFX uh, company. And um, could you tell us a bit more about um, how you integrated, uh, you, how you are integrated in the workflow of the general workflow? At which point you have to begin? Yeah, that's um, well basically from from the very very beginning. And if we go, this is just an example of um, the script report that we had with. Um, extra camera details looking like interactual distance, stereo window, offset background. Um, this seems to be all little tiny details and it just looks like pretty much nothing on the script report but if you don't have this while well, you should and if, you don't, if you're not aware you need to have this and if you don't have um, meetings with the stereographer that just tells you hey the script girl needs to assess all these elements takes about an extra 20 seconds on set but it's vital when you eat post-production and offline editing. Um, and then basically we went through every little process of preparation, shooting, rush editing, um, online editing, layout, animation, every single element had um, a 3D element to it that had just had to be thought about. And that basically all this um, workflow uh, process has been established prior to shooting and even sometimes prior to um, the rig test and camera test um, before the shoot. Okay. So, so, and for every single little um, step, we're thinking, okay, who's the best person to do it? Here, here what we recommend, here what we could do, here how it should be done. And yeah, that's basically how it worked. So the, the sooner you are called for the project, the better you are integrated in the workflow? Yeah, as Josephine and, and Antoine were saying, um, it's just a process that has to be thought a little bit differently because if you think you're going to do a 2D film and just add on an extra camera and let's sort it out later or even in most cases now, let's shoot it in 2D and let's convert it later, it can't work um, if it's properly thought in 3D beforehand. Otherwise, you're just going to hit the hole in post um, or going to hit the, hole, the, the wall when delivering the DCP because the result's going to be appalling because the film won't be thought in 3D. So that, that's, that's what we're trying to, um, the, the main issue we're trying to address is, and every solution can be possible, but it has to be thought at the 3D film before because it is pretty different. And if it's thought earlier, then th certainly the workflow process in post-production is gonna be much smoother and it's gonna cost much less money. Um, and certainly the issue of how much more is it going to cost? Like, could almost become irrelevant um, because you do less shots. You don't need as many. You to cut that many shots as Antoine just said earlier, um, and and all issues in, in in post has been already addressed, and it's suddenly everybody's happier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's not obviously um, more expensive to do a movie in three D. Well, it's, it's hard to say. I think, I think it would probably be wrong. If, again, if you want to do, if you think you're going to do the same film in 2D but just add the 3D on top of it um, as an extra layer on the cake, it, it is going to cost more money. Um, okay. Let's face it. Um, if you think about it earlier differently, um, like a few, like about maybe three, four years ago, we used to say um, when we were tr like working on the preparation that when you change the lens on the camera, you could almost treat it as... Um, uh, a decor setup, and like because it would take quite a lot of time. But now the camera gears evolved so much; it's not the case anymore. Uh, but that's again all the kind of expertise that has to be addressed beforehand. Um, it is true that when it comes to um, to um, SFX, you have to render more images, and that will always be the case. But again, render farms go faster. There's always solutions to keep the cost as close to what is n acceptable in 2D but in 3D as possible. Okay, and uh, with your experience, um, would you say there are like ideas, producer might have ideas, you know, that 
could see great on paper. We could say, hey, is that going to be great in 3D? But then the idea is not working. Or on the contrary, simple ideas that uh, makes really good effects in 3D and are really production values, I would say. I've got so many examples, I don't know where to start. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, it is, it is well, the, the most common mistake is to think of a cut or a shot in 2D, thinking this is great, in 3D it's going to be even better. And sometimes it's not the case, and that's where a stereographer um, on set and on prep, look going through the, through the, 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 the storyboard may go, yeah, that's the shot you want to do, but what about you do this? Because you shot in 3D with the dead axis and the depth will be um, felt differently and you need the shot to be longer. And so that's, that's the case for almost every shot. If you, if you jam jump on a, on a um, 2D film storyboard. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very common and that's why we're here to um, help and recommend people to, that could assess those issues. Okay, thank you very much, Galien. Very Hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so you work for more 20 years at the Stereographer on production, and uh, you're like the engineer behind the magic. You build specialized optics and rigs for different types of cameras. You've been involved on X-Men, the last X-Men, the amazing Spider-Man, and the Metallica through the Never movie. That's true, but don't shortchange me. It's 23 years. Yeah, <laughs> I think more than 20. More than 20 years. <laughs> 22 last year, 23 oh, yeah. this year. Oh, everything's so logical. We've got 3D in the audience right there. That's <laughs> it. I'll, yeah. I'll speak this way, a little bit, make it more exciting. Well, you know, last year we spoke about the whole uh, revolution that yeah. occurred post Avatar. And there was obviously an evolution to this revolution. And I just wanted to show a little bit of that. You know, uh, we've been designing cameras and camera systems and, as uh, Hervé said, optics and various things for a long, long time. And, and this was because at the time that I began, there were no tools. And uh, obviously you've got to have the proper tools to shoot in 3D. And that's not to say that you go get a particular camera, you go hire a particular company, and you're going to have a successful result. Everything that Galleon and everybody else has been talking about is absolutely true. We've got to be thinking about these things in advance of production. And probably the most important thing, which uh, Josephine was touching on, is that the director has got to be on board with the 3D process and the cinematographer. But the director is really the most important person. And I personally have come to really dislike this separation of the stereographer from the cinematographer. I think that's a very bad thing to do. Unfortunately, it has to happen a lot. And particularly on the larger films that I've been involved with, it's a necessity. But it, it almost creates this this rivalry, this fight of, you know, well, the 2D cinematographer wants to do things his traditional way and we'll give you this opportunity to stick in 3D here and there. I'm just kind of scrolling through some of the images of uh, various tools that we've created over the years and as they've evolved, they've had more and more capability. Okay. So for producers, everybody knows 3D means two cameras, but it doesn't mean double teams or equipment. Well, there are certain things, obviously, that are doubled when we're doing 3D. Two cameras and uh, certain additional equipment that's needed to combine the images so they can be properly evaluated on set. But we're certainly not doubling the teams. I like to think that there doesn't need to be anyone additional on set as long as we have a director and a cinematographer who understand what they want from 3D and how to achieve it. Uh, that's part of the problem that we've faced in live-action 3D on larger Hollywood productions is that the producers have seen teams of people who aren't present during 2D films, and that equals more money, more food, more hotel rooms, more day rates. That's no good. Nobody likes that. We don't want that. Uh, want to keep the crew as small as possible. Um, you, you had asked me, Hervé, before the, uh, before the discussion about different camera systems yeah. that can be utilized, and we've seen throughout the evolution a lot of different cameras. It's not about being locked into a particular type of equipment or a particular way of shooting. We've got Ari Alexa M here. This was during the prep for Metallica through the Never. Uh, we've got Red, and we've just recently completed a project with the Red Dragon, which is an amazing piece of technology. Any, any type of camera system can be used. My goal throughout my career has been to eliminate the perceived limitations for directors and cinematographers and let people know that 3D is not this cumbersome beast. Uh, it's really, it should be easy, and all the things that Galliane were saying are critically important to making that happen. 
And could you explain how you work with uh, the DOP during shooting? Sure. Uh, as I said before, there, is t there tends to be this stereographer versus DOP situation where it's kind of a fight. And I've found that there are a lot of directors of photography who uh, fear 3D. And it's something new. They don't want someone else on set telling them what to do with the camera. They have a way of working and they have a comfort zone that they're in that when you try to pull them out of it, the result is not good. Now, of course, there are, there are many uh, exceptions to that rule. We've worked with Haskell Wexler uh, just casually, never on an actual film, but Haskell was very, very interested in 3D. This was an early camera system there. We see him looking through. And I had a wonderful experience with Peter Collister on Amazing Spider-Man. We see Peter here behind the camera. But it's, uh, it's difficult to find a cinematographer who's truly open to the concept of making the film sing in 3D really great because you get to see what other people are doing. Some of the 2D builds that I've seen lately have been absolutely crazy. Mm. Long lenses, Sony F55 builds that are two feet long, definitely more cumbersome than 3D. I, I find it very important to keep the 3D camera moving. Well, we've got some sound over there. This is sort of a guerrilla production that we did. It was a bit of a test in the subway in New York City. You might have seen this online, but this was just to demonstrate how easy it is to move the camera. We literally left the office of 21st Century 3D in New York, went down into the New York City subway. We did not lock up the subway. We did not have any PAs. We did not have any permits. We just walked down the stairs with a 3D camera, and we created this short little uh, sample. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you, of moving the camera around. And the key is the camera is untethered. The camera is very light. It goes onto a beam, a, a, uh, a steady cam very easily. And frankly, this is an old camera. This test is over a year old. This was shot with a BX4. Uh, the photograph you saw of uh, Neil Bryant standing in the water was with a BX5. That was just taken last week. And uh, Neil was in low mode there with carbon fiber epic dragons in our lightest configuration for a, uh, a cinema beam splitter to date. OK. So this, one, uh, this was uh, one, uh, one year ago. Do you have a? Another challenge you addressed this year? Well, you know, always new challenges. There are always new challenges. Uh, this is, again, just a compilation of, you know, some of the ways that we move the camera around. I want to save the real new, new stuff for the surprise that Jacques was uh, referring to. But you can see that, you know, the lightest systems that we've got easily go on to cranes, camera cars, uh, all the types of tools that everybody is used to using. This was a Chapman crane on a boat. This was for Julia X. That was Red Ones, which can be cumbersome. This is Neil's Steadicam build for uh, Daydreams of Dubai, which was just completed last week. That's a BX5 rig with carbon fiber, Red Epics. The Steadicam with the sled and everything was uh, under 20 pounds. What is that in kilograms? 23, 24 kilograms. Very, very light for a Steadicam. As I said, comparable to a 2D build. We see here we had uh, a need to photograph the fountain of Dubai, so we were hard mounting the steady cam on a Garfield mount on a boat out here right in front of the Burj Al Arab, and there's Neil operating uh, as, we, as we did that. So that was really interesting. And we could see him here just you know, running around in the middle of the desert with the steady cam. Yeah. Uh, probably the newest thing I have on here is we were doing some stuff with the GoPro 3 Plus and that was inside the, the world's largest aquarium at the uh, Atlantis in the Palm in Dubai. OK, that gives us lots of ideas for new movies in 3D. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. Hello, Hervé. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. You're welcome. Um, we were speaking about audience immersion uh, with the 3D cinema, 3D images. Um, but the sound has always been in advance with image, but now that image is immersive too, what are the evolution of the sound to adapt to this? Well, we, we always get the question, you know, Barco is preliminary, uh, it's basically an image company. We make projectors for digital cinemas and other professional applications. But as the, the digital conversion was well underway and 3D digital with Avatar made such a storm, we asked exhibitors, what more can we do to make that cinema experience more enveloping, something that's more special, that gets people to come back and make that cultural event that was always ours growing up going to the cinema magical. A and the answer was, well, we need something more to be done with sound. Uh, so with that, we created a partnership with Oral Technologies and, uh, and developed Oro 11.1 uh, by Barco. And we really, 
tried to keep things compatible with existing workflows and the way that cinemas are existingly set up. So we kept the 5.1 system, uh, which is the, the kind of the horizontal layer that's yeah. in most theaters. Uh, and then we added this second dimension to it, which is uh, a middle layer of height. So if you go into a, an Oro-equipped auditorium, you'll look around the walls and you'll see this whole second layer of speakers up on the top side of the wall next to the ceiling. Uh, and then next to that, we have an overhead channel as well. Uh, but for us, it was key to be able to make that 3D sound experience natural, something that wasn't distracting, but something that you could really walk away from and know something was special, something was different. Overhead is, uh, there's not much sound that comes from overhead in real life. Airplanes, bees flying above your head. Uh, but the connection to sound is so subconscious that that special experience really ties into these natural sounds that we can create in this middle layer. Okay, so are you just uh, taking part in the process at the mixing and broadcasting step or, or we sooner? We talk to the productions as, as, soon as, they're, uh, uh, as soon as they're agreeable to do an immersive sound version. Uh, so this year, for example, we started out with, uh, with I, Frankenstein, and then Peabody and Sherman, uh, How to Train Your Dragon 2, which was just premiered as coming out in Oro, Spider-Man 2, um, uh, Expendables 3, and Transformers. They're all being done uh, with an Oro 11.1 version. Uh, you first have to get the deployment into the field. You know, there has to be places to play the film, right? So that's always the first step. Uh, and then you have to get people excited about the possibility of doing immersive sound in a way that doesn't kill their schedule and kill their, their budgets. Uh, and I'm sure Jason experienced this a lot in the beginnings of 3D. I love the picture of Josh Greer, by the way. That was nice. Um, they always say, hey, we, we have a limited time. We have a limited budget. Uh, you can't explode either one of them to add another version of the soundtrack. So we created a workflow that works with the sound designers from the very beginning to work with uh, their creative abilities to create this magical new immersive characteristic to the soundtrack, but keeping with their tool sets, keeping with their budgets, keeping with their timelines. Okay. So you're on sets too. You can be on sets. You've got tools for the sets. We can. Um, okay. uh, there are multiple microphone rigs that are actually quite small that kind of pop out like an umbrella, and you can record these natural ambiences on set okay. um, uh, in nine channels or ten channels or eleven channels. It's up to the creatives to decide what they want to capture on set. Okay. But the most important characteristic of the soundtrack that we've, um, we've done our, our audience surveys on is actually the soundtrack. Because music has such a special connectivity to the emotions of a film. Mm. And when you can capture the scoring session uniquely in immersive sound, it gives it this nice, natural, immersive pump, right? Uh, so the scoring engineers really like being able to add channels. Uh, and, and that's a big help for us in, in post-production because that comes in as a stem and it mixes into the workflow very easily. Okay. We were speaking about uh, how 3D is changing, could change the storytelling. Is the sound a part of this change of the storytelling in movie? Like, is it a new sound design, a new way of designing it sound? In, in, indeed it is. So some of our biggest supporters out there is uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg. He was, of course, here the other night. We did Turbo. We, we do all of the DreamWorks films okay. uh, in Oro 11.1. Uh, and the mixers really like this ability to add an extra dimension to the sound without things being gimmicky. Uh, yes, you can put a sound directly over your head, but you don't want people to you know, look away from the picture yeah. to see what, what was that sound? <laughs> y you need it to be natural. And uh, one of the best quotes that we get from people that attend the screenings in, in Oro is that we've managed to make it sound more enveloping and more immersive and mer more engaging without it hurting, without yeah. it being distracting. Yeah. And uh, that's what's very important to us is to make sure that people get that experience. Okay. It's great. Do you want to add something about the sound, well, maybe you if, if you're not familiar with it, this is basically the setup. So the green yeah. speakers are your traditional 5.1. We try not to touch that. Um, no, 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 go ahead. Excuse uh, me. And we, we add layers on top of that. Well, when we worked with DreamWorks, one of the reasons they were excited about our format above the other formats is that it's got to be cost effective and it's got to be immersive and engaging. And you can't really separate the two because that's what makes a business model. Y you have to have a film that tells the story, but you also have to make a film that people want to go see. And technology is no different. We can't just make a technology that's fun and there's got to be an economic model behind it. So we start with 5.1 and we add these height channels to it. 
Um, and the way that we finally encode the soundtrack allows these high channels to be sucked down into the 5.1 distribution. So there's no separate soundtrack, there's no separate distribution, there's no separate KDM. It all can be contained on the original uh, 5.1 version of the uh, soundtrack. Okay. Very simple. Try to make it simple, make it cost effective, but make it enveloping and, and 3D to the audience when it gets played back. Okay. Thank you very much, Brian. Sure.